Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the final iteration of the Navigating the Virus Crisis webinar series. It's been great to have you join us over the last two months as we've discussed the state of the global economy in these truly unprecedented times. Before we get started, I just want to make you aware that a recording of the webinar will be sent out to you after we finish today. The questions everyone's been asking throughout the series have been fantastic, and I'd, I'd encourage you to uh, please bring them up throughout the presentation today via the questions tab. We will have a dedicated questions section at the end, um, and, and really looking forward to having a discussion with everyone. Just some quick information. Uh, all advice contained in this webinar is general in nature. Please seek out a specialist for personal financial advice. And in terms of our regular contact uh, or content, I, I'd encourage you to visit our website for regular insights, fun data, blogs and investment information. Uh, you can also access all of our upcoming webinars from the website. And, I, and I'd certainly encourage you to uh, subscribe to David's Bassanese Bites section, which, uh, which gives you an update on the state of the global economy every Monday. And please follow us on social media and continue to this, the discussion via the social media channels on the right hand side there. So just to introduce ourselves today, uh, my name is Blair Modica. I'm a director at, at Beta Shares looking after advisor business. And, and I'm joined today by David Bassanese, who has been giving the, these webinar series for the past couple of months. So David is responsible for developing economic insights and, and portfolio construction strategies for advisor and retail clients at Beta Shares. And prior to Beta Shares, David was an economic columnist for the Australian Financial Review for over a decade. So very well credentialed in terms of, of giving you a, a macroeconomic update today. And in terms of what we will cover today, for those who have been tuning in, we've been regularly up, updating the presentation to keep it up to the minute, and, and today is no different. So it'll be an updated version of the, the, the coronavirus and, and COVID-19, followed by a market outlook, and then some investment ideas that are resonating with investors at, at this point in time. So to start off, I'd, I'd like to welcome David to join us and, uh, and give a, a bit of a brief overview of the, the coronavirus as we see it right now. Hi, everybody. Good to be with you all. And uh, uh, welcome to our series of uh, the next uh, update in our series. Uh, and again, we've been doing these somewhat more regularly than normal, just given the extreme volatility in both the markets uh, and the economy in the wake of the coronavirus. So. We will probably be reverting to a more, you know, uh, less frequent pattern you know, as things start to settle down. But um, for the moment, we've been doing this on a, on a fortnightly basis. So let, without further ado, let me get, and again, for regular listeners, some of this, uh, uh, the structure will be similar, uh, but there a, there's a few variations around the edges. So just a, a first up, an update really on the coronavirus situation. Uh, as you can see there, I've compared it to a number of different um, uh, pandemics and you know diseases that have affected the world historically the coronavirus is there and, and highlighted so we're now looking at 4.8 million people according to john hopkins university uh as of yesterday uh have contracted the virus uh probably many more that have gone unreported and uh, just over 300,000 uh deaths and the, uh, the death rate there you know the ratio of deaths to those infected uh still at that level still pretty high like six percent um, and again, but what we probably suspect is there's a lot of unreported cases um, that have gone uh, that have gone along, and so the death rates probably isn't six percent. It's probably closer to still one uh, percent or so. But nonetheless, the key is that it's still higher than we saw in the past. Uh, everything since the Spanish flu of 1918, so this Asian flu, Hong Kong flu, uh, swine flu. If you actually look at the daily number of cases, I mean. You know, it, the, the, where where the virus has been affecting has shifted. So obviously, China and Asia was most affect, was affected uh, first. Then it crossed over into Europe, and so uh, Japan, uh, sorry, um, Spain, Italy, uh, the United Kingdom, in particular, uh, France, and to some extent Germany were affected. And now it's crossed over into the United States, uh, and more recently into Latin America and 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 uh, areas like Russia. So Latin America now is is front and centre in terms of dealing with the, the onslaught of the, of the virus. But look, the net result of all of that is, as you can see here, the rate of daily, the daily rate of new cases globally hasn't really, it has flattened, but it's basically stayed at, at this stubbornly high level, um, you know, for a number of weeks now. Um, uh, although the, where, which countries it's been affecting has, has changed over time. So that's the situation with the, and if you look at it, 
uh, you go break it down by region. If we just go to the next slide there, this is a chart from the Financial Times. All those, those gray areas are bas basically the patterns from different countries. Um, and I've just highlighted three there, three uh, that are you know, most affected in Europe. So Italy, Spain and Germany. And as you can see, so the rate of daily cases uh, has, 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 is coming in, which is good. I mean, they're still, you know, high. They have, and it's not zero. It's not like in Australia where it's come down to practically zero. Uh, but it's nonetheless flat and such that they have started to slowly, uh, and I emphasise the point slowly, uh, open up their economies. Uh, again, uh, re reducing the social distancing provisions. But as you can see, the rate of daily uh, infections uh, is still uh, at, a, at a you know reasonable level in the, even those countries. If you look elsewhere, looking at the United States, for example, uh, so New York and California were the two major. Again, the, when the markets basically bottomed in late March was when both New York and California went into full lockdown and basically assured the US would have a recession. Uh, at least, uh, uh, you know, how long and, and a very deep recession, how long it lasts is the next question. But at the moment, no question that the US is in recession and probably in depression at the moment, though the debate is just that it may not last that long. At least that's what the markets are counting on. But again, if you look at areas like New York and California, it had like, so New York, yes, the rate of new, new infections, this is a seven day, all of these are seven day rolling averages. So just to smooth it out, so the more recent numbers may be a bit lower than this, but that's the, the rolling average. Yes, so they've come down, but I mean, still, you know, you would say uh, uncomfortably high. I mean, now testing has picked up as well. So, you know, as many point out, we are, they are discovering a lot of cases because they're doing a lot more testing. So that is also true. Uh, Florida, I guess, is another major state in the US, which Again, it's flattened off and the debate is raging in Florida because they are opening up their state again. You know, people are going back to the beaches. It is coming up to summer. Um, and there's some debate as to, you know, whether or not they've, um, you know, really got this under control or not. And uh, But at the moment, I mean, that's the sort of situation. Where it's um, it's coming down. Uh, I mean, people are saying Florida, Florida risks a second wave. Well, it's actually still in the first wave. I mean, we're not even over the first wave yet to, before we even need to talk about a, a second wave at the moment. So look, so the reality is US, the cases, again, you can argue it's maybe because they're testing a lot, but there's still the number of cases being reported uh, is still, I would say, uncomfortably high, but the pressure is on to open up their economies. And so basically I think, you know, living in a democracy, you can only keep, you know, close people up for so long and they basically have to open up the economy again, even at the risk of a of an increase in infections, um, just to, um, and, and basically, you know, I guess see what happens, you know, open up the economy. If the virus does flare up again, uh, they then they have the, you know, I guess the political cover to, to close things down, down again. But just simply keeping the economy closed um, because of the risk of this is probably, you know, politically untenable increasingly in many uh, de democracies. Um, going forward, so this is uh, the case in some other countries. And, you know, China, I mean, people debate whether China uh, has really, you know, the, the likelihood is that Chinese cases were actually a lot higher than they ever really reported, have come down. As you can see, they, they, they were the first country affected. And you're seeing sporadic evidence of, you know, little breakouts still in China. So there's, a you know, again, another little breakout in the northern parts of China, uh, largely driven by uh, people from coming across from Russia. Um, and again, it's hard, you wouldn't call that a, a second wave across the country, but it just shows you that, you know, these outbreaks can, uh, can uh, flare up again. Uh, South Korea also had a bit of an outbreak where there was one particular person, you know, who um, had the virus and, you know, right, you know, un, un, unbeknownst to him, he had it and he went out, you know, night clubbing, I think it was, uh, around um, uh, in Seoul and um, obviously it led to a bit of an outbreak there. And if you look at Iran, it's another example where Iran's still fairly high cases and in fact there's been a tick up in the more recent weeks. So it just shows you it is hard to snuff this, uh, this virus out um, and it's still percolating. If you look at the case in Australia, just going to the next slide, um, you know, we've done pretty well, so, and, and New Zealand also. Um, so the number of, you know, new cases, uh, you know, very, very low levels now. Um, and, you know, some of that is still just, you know, arising from, uh, from, uh, from testing. And again, this is a, a rolling average. And so the actual 
new cases in the last few days is actually you know, practically zero. Uh, I think you know we can count it on the number uh, on one hand the number of new cases I think we're getting. So so far so good. Uh, as 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 I've pointed out in the past, I mean we are in the southern hemisphere, so we are facing our winter where you know spreading uh, viruses, uh, influenza is is a lot easier. Whereas the northern hemisphere, the US, Europe are now moving into their summer, so arguably the risks of you know major spreading is less. So we, yes, we've tackled it better, um, and it helps that we have a you know we're an island. We've been able to close off our borders pretty well, uh, but but just given the fact that we're heading into winter means that we probably still need to remain uh, fairly cautious. But nonetheless, you know we are opening up, as I'm sure if you read the reports, you can. You know, we are gradually, you know, kids are going back to school in New South Wales next week. I'm, you know, my children are very happy to hear that. Uh, you wouldn't think that, but they're actually keen to get back to school. So there's an example of, of things getting back, uh, you know, slowly, slowly back. But again, if you go to a local cafe at the moment, uh, still severe social, you know, cafes are expected to survive with only having 10 customers at any one time. Um, you know, good luck with that. But that's the situation at the moment. If you look at some of the economic data, I mean, again, I won't go through a lot of the data. I mean, it's suffice to say it's absolutely, you know, abysmal. Uh, but the markets, as we'll touch on, are basically looking through all this because they're focused on the reopening and, and the hope that things can get back to normal. I mean, that's the big question. So this is just, I guess if there's one single indicator that summarises the whole global economy, it's this, it's the market global PMI index, which covers both manufacturing and services. And that's the reading for April. You can see it just fell off a cliff. Um, so much, much worse than we saw during the GFC uh, and much, much worse during the, the recession of 0102. Basically, come out of the dot-com bubble um, uh, early last, uh, last uh, decade. Um, so more recent signs. I mean, if you can look at China, that their indicators have bounced back somewhat. I mean, th these numbers will start to bounce back, no, no question, but it just shows the severity of the decline um, that we, we've currently gone through. And just another one to highlight, I mean, this is the um, labour market numbers that came out in Australia last week. Um, if we just go to the next slide there. So this is the ratio of employment to population in Australia. Now, as you can see, basically plummeting uh, in the month of April. So I'm sure you read the headline, 600,000 jobs lost uh, in the month. Uh, and the unemployment rate actually only went up to about 6.2%. And now it would have been a lot higher, but actually 500,000 people, uh, rather than recording themselves as as looking for a job, basically, you know, are, are not working, but define themselves as not even bothering to look for a job. So the way in which the ABS define that is they're not in the labour force, and so they're not counting uh, counted as part of the unemployment numbers. So that what 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 sort of kept that unemployment rate probably artificially low, um, the so-called worker dis the discouraged worker effect, where people you know, basically, yes, I'm at home. Yes, I'm not working. But you know what? I'm not really looking for a job. I mean, you know, things are so you know bleak at the moment. You know, why would I bother? Well, to the ABS, that means you're not you're not unemployed. Um, but the but the actual result of all that is it still shows up in the very low level of employment to to overall working age population, as you can see from this slide here. Um, the other interesting feature of of the the labour market at the moment is something like six million people uh, are getting the the government's job keeper payments. So again, if uh, a business can demonstrate a substantial decline in revenue, I think it's a 50%, uh, sorry, 30% for small businesses under a billion dollars uh, in sales and, and I think 30% for those uh, over a billion, um, then they can get a, they can apply to have their workers getting $1,500 a fortnight uh, as a, a subsidy to, and whether they're working or not. I mean, this is the thing, you could have workers, you know, at home doing nothing, but you're giving them this job subsidy payment um, such that, you know, when the economy opens up again, the theory is that then it'll be easier to restart. You won't have to go searching for workers. You can really pick up where you left off. Uh, but, you know, so something like half the half the work, half the half the uh, labour force, um, you know, six million people, almost half the labour force are on some form of job keeper payment. Um, and so many of those are probably not working as well. So, you know, I would argue the unemployment rate effectively in Australia is probably closer to, um, you know, 20, 30 percent at the moment rather than 6 percent. Um, just in terms of, so look, that's the economic, again, the markets are not, you know, what's been remarkable over the past few weeks is just the, the ability of the markets to look through this data. I mean, they're focusing on the fact that we have, you know, 
seemingly uh, um, put a uh, cap on, on, on new infections uh, and economies are slowly opening up. The other big thing that's been boosting markets is a hope for, of drugs and, and new vaccines. Um, and just to, again, an update on this situation. So remdesivir, which was one which was touted a few weeks ago, that saw the markets um, rally for a day on, on the announcement of their drug trials. Ultimately, if you look at those results, it was pretty marginal. You know, those that took the drug uh, with severe conditions, 8% of them still died versus 11% or 12% uh, that were on a placebo in that trial. So, yes, it was statistically significant, but uh, you wouldn't, it's not a silver bullet. It still means, you know, people are, you know, dying um, that, with severe cases. And even, even with the drug, you still need to spend, on average, needed to spend 11 days in hospital. Um, more recently, the, the Moderna company announcing early stage of their trials and again, this only happened a couple of days ago. And again, if you, the markets have since poured a bit of cold water on their results. I mean, funnily enough, they announced this result on the same day that they asked for a share issuance. So they basically issued shares on the same day, day their, their, their stock rallied significantly on this news. And what they released was the, part of the partial results of a first stage trial. So they, they tested their vaccine on 44 people. They, they provided the results of eight people. Uh, and those eight people happen to be in the younger cohort as well. Um, and they didn't actually give a lot of evidence in terms of, you know, how, you know, how good those actual results were. It was, it was basically all in a, a press release, not a scientifically vetted uh, article. Uh, so a lot of scientists uh, that came out a day after sort of expressing some scepticism about, uh, about the numbers. You know, it's not dismissing it. It could ultimately be the silver bullet. And there's many other groups around the world feverishly working on a vaccine. Uh, but even if it is, chances are it's still going to take at least by the end of the year, if not early next year, before it passes all the trials and, and becomes you know, readily available for the vast bulk of the population. So that isn't going to save Australia through our current winter. It's not going to save the US through their upcoming winter season as well, um, certainly not the early part of it. So uh, vaccines definitely are the end result, but at this stage it's still early days to say that this is um, you know, going to be available uh, anytime soon. And with that, it obviously then still gives, gives rise to the second wave risks. Um, again, this is a slide. This is from what happened in England and Wales back in the 19, uh, during the 1918 outbreak. I just use this slide because it's a nice, easy chart to demonstrate what a second wave looks like. Um, there are some charts also that show second waves in Sydney, for example, during 1918. Uh, and if you look at the Asian flu, the, uh, the, uh, the Hong Kong flu, of the 50s and 60s and even the swine flu of 09, you did get second waves. Now the swine flu of 09, as I've said in the past, uh, basically affected something like 40% of the global population. Uh, but the, the, you know, the severity, it wasn't a very severe um, uh, influenza. So it didn't lead to a lot of deaths and a lot of hospitalizations. And so that's why the world was able to cope with that. Um, without having to shut down their economies in the way we have at the moment. But nonetheless, even that virus had a second wave. Um, so again, if you're a betting person, you would, a second wave is more likely than not, I would still argue, and that is going to be a risk for markets um, going forward over the next, uh, next few months, and particularly given the, the, U, the US situation where they are, they are opening up. Uh, they don't have a lot of the testing and screening capacity certainly to the extent that some Asian countries like Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore do. Um, so they are, you know, I think, still quite vulnerable to, to second waves. In terms of the market outlook uh, in, the, in the remaining minutes that I have with you, just to sort of give you the situation. Um, firstly, you know, why has the market rebounded so quickly? Just a, a couple of points here. Firstly, like the speed of the decline. I mean, basically when you get a, typically when you get a very fast, furious decline without any pauses, uh, the rebound can also be particularly fast, as we've seen, because basically, when you think about it, technically, no one's had a chance to buy into the, the, the sell-off. And so then no one's, you know, um, having bought and then the market goes down, they're sort of underwater on having bought in early. Uh, typically, that then provides a bit of um, a headwinds when the market rebounds, because those people that, you know, bought in, uh, then were underwater then they feel, you know, they want, they can now square up and sell their position. So that sort of selling, natural selling, um, that, that uh, because of people having been able to buy in when the market sold off is not here. So the markets have actually been able to, to rebound fairly fast uh, as a result. 
The other thing, I mean, what this is what the markets are grappling with. I mean, this is a backwards recession. The worst part of the recession globally is right now. Um, so all the data that we're seeing is is at the at the worst, and then it will gradually get better. But the, the what the challenge for the markets and then over the next three to six months is that economic conditions could still be as bad as we see during a recession uh, in six months' time. It's just that relative to where we are today, it will be better. Um, so the markets are focusing on the rate of change and at the moment not focusing on the fact that the level of activity uh, and certainly the level of corporate earnings, as I'll touch on in a minute, will be a lot lower uh, than where we currently are. Looking at the markets, just a quick, uh, and what we've seen, you know, a lot, very important market developments really in the last uh, few days. This is the US market really, as you can see the, the severity of that slump. Uh, and then we've risen in, in stages over the past uh, past month or so. And there was a period there for a couple of weeks where we did start to top out. Uh, the market was struggling to push on to new highs, uh, as you can see. And it looked as if it was starting to break down and it tested the lows. And just in the last couple of days, we've pushed up to new highs again. So this is a sort of, you know, technically people are saying, oh, this is a breakout. We've, and so maybe the market can now push on. And so, you know, in the short run, the, the market is still below, for example, its 200-day moving average. Um, it could test that 200-day moving average, could get up above 3,000. Uh, definitely no, no question at the moment. The market has a lot of momentum behind it. There's a lot of, um, you know, uh, fear of missing out, I guess, or whatever you want to call it. But um, I'm still very, very dubious of this rally uh, for some of the reasons that I'll touch on in a minute. But that's technically is the situation for the S&P. If you look at the Australian market, we haven't rebounded as strongly. Uh, but nonetheless, we've and we've stabilised. Um, if you just go to the next slide, there on the uh, ASX 200, as you can see, our rebound has not been as strong as the S&P. Again, we don't have the tech sector in the US, the Googles, the Amazon, Facebooks. So it's really roared back uh, in a big way. But again, having stabilised for a few weeks, we are now tentatively breaking out to new high. Uh, well, out of the range that we've been in uh, up to 5600, and again, you know, we could push up higher. Uh, in the short run, um, you know, no question. And again, look, the news flow at the moment, the markets are dismissing all the obvious negative news, all the, you know, the plummeting sales, the plummeting uh, manufacturing indices, um, and they're latching on to all the good news. And the good news is that, you know, the virus seems to be you know, flattening off and we're opening up the economy. So if they're dismissing all the bad news and focusing on the good news, sure, markets can rise in the, in the, in the, in the short run. Uh, and so at the moment, the news flow, you know, to be to be fair, is is likely to remain positive, you know, unless Donald Trump suddenly has a new trade war with China and announces new tariffs or, or something like that. Otherwise, markets are going to gradually open up. Uh, some of those um, absolutely plummeting economic indicators that we had will start to bounce. Um, and, you know, things will look encouraging. Um, again, the problem will come, you know, do we get a second wave and or after we get that initial bounce, will activity still be fairly subdued? Uh, just some other charts uh, to, to uh, the Aussie dollar. Again, the Aussie dollar has been incredibly highly correlated with the rebound in global equities. So you can see having got under 60 cents in late March, it's now pushing up to the mid 60 cent uh, region. Uh, and again, in the short run, may well push up higher. You know, it's obviously had it sort of technically it's broken out uh, and, it's, and it's looking positive. So if equity markets keep rallying here, uh, Aussie dollar can also uh, continue to rally. The other one, interestingly, is gold. And this is one I do like, even on a short and longer run view. And you can see that's broken out as well. And it's actually held up. And it's actually rallied, even though equities have rallied um, more recently. And um, so it has been has acted as a safe haven on and off over time. And I, I just think gold going forward, if I'm right, and equities do give back some of their recent gains, uh, risk off behaviour returns at some stage. Central banks will be adamant that they'll keep policy interest rates low I think, and, 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 and basically, um, you know, mon uh, monetary conditions very loose. That would be positive for, for gold. And just to, you know, some of the challenges here, again, I won't go over this in detail, but and it, it's a bit of a complicated slide if you just go to the next one. But the bottom line is that the markets, I've got what I've got there are earnings expectations as in January. Uh, as we are at the moment at May and what I expect to happen over the next few months, say by August. So as you can see, the markets are pricing in now a substantial decline in US earnings for calendar 2020 uh, and more, but I think there's actually more that needs to be priced in over the next few months. So instead of a 23% decline, which is pretty significant, 
it should, could actually be 35, uh, if not a bit more. Uh, bottom line is that forward earnings, which is an average of uh, earnings for 2020 and 2021, are likely to continue to fall. And if you look at it, the price to earnings ratio for the US market is now around about almost 21 times earnings, even higher than it was at the market peak, uh, would you believe, earlier this year. Now, if the market just stays where it is and earnings keep falling, um, the PE ratio is going to keep rising. And in fact, it's on track to rise to around about 24, uh, possibly even 20. Uh, certainly, if the market keeps rising, we get there even quicker. Uh, so it's on track to rise to levels we haven't seen since the dot-com bubble 20 years ago. So that's the situation. In Australia, similar, I'm looking at more earnings downgrades to come through. We've actually priced in a reasonable amount of earnings downgrades. Uh, valuations still high, you know, we're actually at uh, 17 times earnings on the way, I think, to around about 18, even at current levels, uh, which for our market is getting pretty expensive. Uh, but again, the markets are looking through this earnings at the moment and uh, they're saying, well, you know, okay, earnings may drop, but they could rebound fast in 2021. That's where I still have a disagreement, but that's sort of why the markets are operating where they have, where, where they are at the moment. Uh, in terms of scenarios, and, and my colleague Blair will touch on some of the uh, different uh, different ways to which to play this market. I've actually, oh, sorry, before I go on, this is the, the other bull case, the fact that bond yields in the US are so low. So the US 10-year bond yields at half a percent. So from a very broad one, this is a US PE ratio versus bond yields. And so you could argue, given bond yields are so low at half a percent, yes, 20 times earnings possibly justified because of just the sheer low level of bond yields. Um, again, I still think that's still an outrageously high valuation if you just look at it from history. And certainly, even if bond yields stay where they are, if the market pushes up to 25 times earnings, uh, that's going to start looking pretty pricey. And again, nothing... A level we haven't seen since the height of the dot-com bubble back in the late 1990s. In terms of scenarios, I've actually boiled them down to um, really the two things. A, the speed of the, the speed with which uh, social distancing restrictions are removed uh, and how the virus um, and economic reactions, uh, the, how the economy reacts. And so, for example, the, the, the bull case is that restrictions are removed very fast. You know, maybe some states in the US like Florida uh, remove their restriction very fast. They get no second wave of, of infections um, and or some v vaccine mirac miraculously arrives on the, on the horizon. But more likely the issue is they, they remove their restrictions fast and they get no second wave. So that is consistent with a V-shaped recovery, which, which what markets are currently pricing in. But in some areas like Australia, where we are removing our restrictions relatively slowly, then even if you don't get a second wave, uh, the, the recovery is still going to be pretty U-shaped. Um, so, again, it's partly in, in our hands as to the speed of the recovery is how quickly we remove restrictions. So in the case of Australia, given we're in our winter, our governments have been particularly cautious, um, it's probably we're going to remove those restrictions slowly and so it's going to be more consistent with the U-shaped recovery. Um, the less op the, I mean, the worst case scenario is, is we get second waves and or even if we don't get second waves, businesses and households remain very cautious uh, because, again, even if you don't get a second wave, the mere risk of that could lead to a lot of caution by households uh, and, and certainly businesses cutting back their investment plans. And so one scenario is a W, so we get an early removal of restrictions. Growth does bounce back for a very short-run period of time. Then we get a second wave of infections, restrictions are reimposed, and we drop back down again, and then we can't really recover in a decent way Till we get a vaccine. So that's sort of like a W-shaped recovery. And the L is where you get these, um, you, something like that, and all businesses and consumers just remain very, very cautious um, in, in spending again. Uh, so they are the various scenarios. But I mean, on my base case at the moment is a sort of a U-shaped recovery, not a V-shaped recovery. Um, and so, yes, we will get an initial bounce in some indicators, but thereafter, I think things will still be fairly restrained for the rest of the year. Um, so that's pretty much the out the uh, situation. And with that, I'll hand over to my colleague Blair to go through some investment ideas and come back to questions. Great, thank you, David. Uh, I think it's fair to say, whilst there are some signs of positive shoots, uh, certainly a large amount of uncertainty remains within the market. Um, so, David, as you said, I'll, I'll just touch on quite quickly some ideas that are resonating with. 
the uh, the advisor market, but also I guess the retail market as well. Um, just to point you in the direction of, of what's resonating out there in the market. So I guess starting with that W type of scenario where markets still remain quite choppy, there is a few ways within the beta shares suite to be able to express that view. First being those short positions or BBOZ and BBUS. So essentially inverse type strategies that will give you, I guess, positive capital performance when the market is negative. So for example, BEAR will give you one for one exposure to a falling Australian market. BBOZ and BBUS are geared versions that will highlight or, or uh, gear performance as the market falls. So strategy of profit when, when the market is falling or indeed hedge your portfolios of, of equities at this point in time. Um, the second one there, AAA cash. So obviously with, with rates where they're at, traditionally platform cash and certainly cash at bank is yielding very low amounts. A swap into AAA gives you, I guess, exposure to bank deposits. And, and a yield of around 0.72% per annum, and that's paid out to you monthly. So just a strategy to make a little bit more from your cash, or indeed, if you are worried about where markets are at, a place to park your, your cash from equities whilst markets remain volatile. QAU, as David mentioned, is our gold fund, so a traditional safe haven asset. What we like about this asset at this period in time is, first of all, we know that when markets become volatile, gold becomes popular. Given where, I guess, the, the macroeconomic picture looks at this point in time, gold is quite attractive. The other thing we think that this investment in the beta shares suite uh, gives, gives investors is that, is that currency hedging. So you're, you're hedging out your exposure to wider currencies and just basically getting the spot price movement of, of gold. Um, and uh, I guess over time, that's proven to be beneficial, especially when you're, you're factoring in the Australian dollar. The best example being the GFC, where if you weren't hedged out on, on your currency, you would have lagged in terms of performance uh, to, to the spot price of gold. We see that breaking out again here. Obviously, the Australian dollar plummeted uh, at the beginning of the crisis, but it has begun to recover. Um, so uh, I guess, again, positive outperformance with respect to QAU and currency hedging. In terms of a, a fixed income strategy, AGVT is an Australian government bond investment. Um, and essentially what that is giving you is longer duration or, or sensitivity to interest rates, which if we get further cuts and, and indeed more quantitative easing, that is going to have a positive uh, impact on the value of, of this fund. Um, and, and whilst it pays off very low yield, obviously uh, giving you more of a pickup than cash, but uh, with the potential for the capital value to move as interest rates move around. And the final one, which is generating a fair amount of interest, is, is the managed risk suite. So WRLD and AUST. What these investments are, are underlying investments into the MSCI world and the ASX 200. And we use a risk management overlay in conjunction with Milliman to provide a handbrake on the portfolio. So as volatility increases in the market, we will increase our hedge uh, by shorting futures so that your, your exposure to the market is nullified and it protects you from a drawdown. So in general, we've seen protection from around two thirds of the market drawdown uh, impact in market sell off So something to be aware of if you think the, the market is going to be uh, volatile and, and moving downward over the, uh, the, the next couple of months. Just moving on to, to the next slide, I guess if we're, we're looking at a, a more slower recovery ahead, um, given uncertainty, better to be positioned in a portfolio of, of high quality global companies with lower debt, higher earnings certainty and strong profitability. So with the beta shares global quality leaders, there's a natural tilt to healthcare at 33% and technology stocks at 23% with lower allocations to consumer discretionary at 12, financials at seven and, and real estate at 1% in particular. So the key metric with, uh, with respect to this particular fund is high but sustainable return on equity. And companies generally that can, uh, can sustain that and show that metric outperform over the long run. So that fund's available at 35 basis points. So if you, hence, if you believe that the worst of the market falls are behind us in the current crisis, but the path to recovery is a long run, then getting exposure to quality global companies may make a lot of sense. 
Um, and as I said, quality available at 35 basis points. The, the next U-shaped performer could be hybrid as well. So again, if you believe the worst is behind us, you might believe hybrid offers high, highly attractive mix of capital gains from that spread compression, growth yield, which is currently 4.2%, with a high degree of capital stability to equities, um, which get essentially strong risk adjusted returns. So cool of our capital are the manager of this fund and are bullish on hybrids over the next 12 months. Um, in comparison to prior to the GFC, bank issuers have reduced their leverage from about 21 times in 07 to around eight times today in risk weighted terms. They've de-risked their businesses in complexity and credit risk lending standards and enjoy stronger government and regulatory support. Um, so I guess conversely, if you look at bank equities in this point in time, they've suffered, I guess, profitability wise from falling interest rates and poor economic environments. So we feel that recent capital raises in this environment from the big banks may make hybrids a more prudent investment than, than bank equities. And that hybrid fund is available at 55 basis points. So if you, I guess on to the next slide, if we're positioning for a more a swifter recovery, uh, we, we like growth over value in that V-shaped type of scenario. And two of the, uh, uh, I guess, exposures there that we're seeing a lot of interest in are uh, ATEC, which is an Australian technology index. So beta shares are the first provider to bring out a, an exposure purely to Australian technology. Um, with all of the, the big companies in there like Wise Tech, Afterpay, so on and so forth, Really giving a boost to those uh, small cap uh, technology companies that um, that you know need funding in this period of time, and certainly encouraging innovation within the Australian technology piece. The next one uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with is Nasdaq, the Nasdaq 100 fund. Um, obviously, it's held up very well given this current market sell-off with those fang type of companies, Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google but also Amazon uh, and Microsoft as well, held up very well over the current volatile period. If you look at the, the chart, obviously you see that the NASDAQ 100 has outperformed significantly against the S&P 500 over a long period of time, but more importantly, I guess recently, uh, which, which shows signs of, uh, I guess, resilience in the face of a, a global economic meltdown. And, and I guess just to, I guess, pose the case for NASDAQ 100 a bit further, under a V-shaped scenario, you might expect a period of earnings disruption, most impacting companies with heavy debt loads and, and narrow operating leverage. So in this case, you want business models that are less impacted by disruption. I guess that is they make more money while you sleep, shop online or watch Netflix, and certainly the NASDAQ is giving you that. And with huge cash reserves and, and low to zero dividend payout ratios, companies like Apple, Microsoft, Amazon and Alphabet are not only well positioned to weather the current market storm, but when the dust finally settles, they may end up in a stronger position to displace the old economy incumbents. I guess the best example there, Amazon versus brick and mortar retail. So I think it's quite a strong case for both Aussie technology and NASDAQ in a, in a V-shaped type of recovery. Now, just uh, I guess moving on to a, a few popular funds we've seen from the wider market in terms of what people are interested in. So we wanted to give you a look at some of the popular funds that have been resonating strongly with our investors. And the first is fuel. Um, and, and what fuel is giving you is a simple and cost-effective way to gain exposure to a diversified portfolio of the world's largest energy companies in, in one single trade. And perhaps what's more interesting there is the correlation to the Brent crude oil price. So you'll see that it has tracked it quite significantly and in fact outperformed it given the, the current uh, market volatility within the oil space. So uh, I guess an alternative to getting uh, synthetic exposure to oil is take an equities approach through fuel and, and, and play that oil thematic. The next one uh, that we're seeing a lot of interest in is the beta shares at Global Healthcare ETF. Again, currency hedged, and, and the ticket code for that is DRUG, D-R-U-G. Uh, and, and really, you're playing off a search for the vaccine for the coronavirus. Um, companies there, Gilead, Johnson & Johnson, Roche, and AstraZeneca, so large multinational pharmaceutical companies which traditionally have performed well in, in, in economic downturns. Um, and lead the chase for, I guess, not only the, the vaccine for the coronavirus, but other human ailments. Um, 
and, and we've got in there, uh, I guess, again, ATEC just aiming to track the performance of the S&P ASX 200 All Technology Index. So as I touched on before, the first exposure to the Australian Technology Index, um, and again, has performed quite well or exceedingly well against the ASX 200 over the current market downturn. Another interesting one that you may be familiar with and, and certainly been very popular over the last few years is Hack. Hack's actually been or has had positive performance year to date, which I think is quite impressive given, given the market volatility. But you can see there, I guess the thematic makes sense and continues to make sense going forward. In 2016, $2.2 billion worth of revenue um, in the space, but, but looking forward to 2026, $6 billion, so 10 pound, sorry, 10 year compound annual growth rate of 10.6%. In 2017, the, the cybersecurity workforce was 19,500 or, or you know, 20,000. That will increase by 2026 to 31,600. But what you're investing in here is global cybersecurity companies. And I think that the need for that going forward is going to be quite, um, quite telling. The US government alone spends $20 billion or more a year on cybersecurity. And it seems to be quite economic resilient uh, to, to market downturns. If you think about it, when companies go out for a mandate on cyber security, the company that wins tends to stick that contract out. It, it's quite sticky money uh, and therefore they, they are poised to continue to perform uh, over the long term. And the, the last one, I guess, in the technology piece is Asian technology, the ticket code there, ASIA. Uh, you'll see on the chart here, uh, the potential for Asia's online e-commerce is significant. It vastly outweighs the number of internet users in, China, in the USA, so all, all, more than double the amount of daily internet users. Quickly, you can see uh, the, the need for e-commerce in, in China in particular is huge, which creates a great revenue opportunity. Some stocks in the portfolio include Tencent, Alibaba, JD and Baidu, so those Chinese giants in terms of, I, I guess, um, technology uh, in the modern world. Um, so a large proportion of, of the fund is Chinese, I think about 55%, but it also includes significant exposures to South Korea, Taiwan, India and Hong Kong. That's available at a 67 basis point fee. Finally, I, I just wanted to touch on ethical investing, which I think more now than ever is resonating with the wider, wider investor space. Uh, obviously, we had the horrible bushfires over December and January, and now, you know, the coronavirus, really a lot of people are thinking ethically um, and, and want to get their hands on ESG type of exposure. The first one in the, in the beta share suite is EPHI, -E is the ticket code there. It's, a, it's an index of 200 sustainable businesses, excluding Australia. And the way we filter for those ESG type businesses is, is really, you need to be 60% more carbon efficient than your peers. And then we run a whole raft of negative screens. So whether that's gambling, tobacco, pornography, or, or even down into you know, minutia de minute details like um, you know, supply chain concerns, human rights issues, which generally can be um, you know, hard to quantify. We're able to, uh, I guess, lean off the back of reports to, to come to a conclusion on what companies are performing well there and then include them in the index. So 200 sustainable businesses, that's available at 59 basis points. The, the next one in our ethical suite is FAIR, F-A-I-R, and that focuses on Australian businesses in an ESG sense. That's available at 49 basis points and leverages off a very similar screening process to EFI. Um, and again, if you look at both EFI and FAIR in terms of their overall performance against the wider market, very, very strong performance. And, and really, there's no surprise there given you're screening out energy companies, which traditionally over the last few years haven't done well. And there is a tilt towards technology and, and pharmacy or, or biochemical um, companies that are, you know, ranked very highly from a ESG point of view. Uh, and the, the last one in the ethical suite is, is a new investment from beta shares, GBND or green bonds. And again, using a, a similar type of process in terms of screening. So it's a 50-50 exposure to international bonds and 50% Australian bonds. Internationally, we're using uh, green bonds in the portfolio and, and at home, we're using that screening that I, that I went over previously. 
And you can see there, GBND has outperformed its benchmark, the 50-50 Osborne Global Index, um, significantly over over a significant period of time. So again, what we're what we're giving you at Peter Shares is the ability to create a diversified ESG portfolio within a number of trades. So you can get Australian, international, and fixed income exposure through Beta Shares um, for for ESG investing. So. Just, just to cover off, obviously there is risks or are risks to consider when investing uh, in anything um, and, and I encourage you to look over that in your own time uh, when we make the presentation available. But I'd like to thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, this is the final iteration of our virus crisis webinar series. For those that have tuned in throughout the, uh, the journey, we really appreciate your, your attendance and, and hopefully we've been able to give you some ideas and, um, and really give you the state of play in terms of how things are playing out worldwide. Um, hopefully, you know, we, we can get to the end of this crisis sooner rather than later, but, but certainly appreciate your time. And I'd, I'd welcome anyone to, to send through those questions now. I know we've received a couple over the course of the presentation. Give us a few minutes, uh, we'll come back to you and I'll, I'll answer them with David. Thank you very much. Yeah, hi Blair, can you hear me? Yeah, I can Dave. Uh, Great, thanks fantastic. For continuing to join us. Look, I know, you, I know you touched on it, but there's been a few questions just on, I guess, the AUD vis-a-vis -vis to the, the, the US dollar and, and mm -hmm. your outlook there. Uh, how do you see that? Well, it's as I said, it's highly correlated with the equity market at the moment. Um, it's really it's a risk on risk off situation in the in the short uh, short term. Uh, well, over the next three to six months. So if you feel that the equity markets are, are going to keep keep rallying from here, then the Aussie will keep rallying as well and probably hit you know go up to seventy cents or, there, or thereabouts. It's getting pretty you know I think getting pretty exy where it is now, the mid 60 cent range. Now, the, the other positive for the Aussie, let's not uh, forget, is look, we've done better than most in terms of the virus, so, um, and so, so which is good. Also that China is looking to stimulate its economy again by relying on, uh, you know, typical infrastructure programs, uh, and I certainly demand for iron ore uh, is remaining quite high coming out of China. And at the same time, unfortunately, Brazil, is now being, you know, hit by the coronavirus front and centre, which uh, potentially could disrupt their supply of iron ore. So, that, uh, in the same way that the dam disasters uh, a year or so ago uh, upset Brazil. So, there are some positives in the sense of China and iron ore for the Aussie dollar, um, but the big driver is still just the global equity market outlook. So, I'm, you know, end of the day, I'm cautious on the Aussie. Uh, if I, I think equities are going to start to, at, at best, start to taper off, start to go sideways here and wait for the fundamentals to catch up. That's like a best case scenario, in which case the Aussie will start to level off. Uh, but if we do peel back, then the Aussie will pull back. So I actually do have a view that the Aussie will be back under 60 cents uh, within the next um, within the next three months uh, on, on the view the equity markets will, will peel back somewhat as well. So that's you know how I'm sort of seeing it at the moment. And Dave, uh, just in terms of the U shape or, or W shape recovery, how, how long do you see them playing out? So a, a timeline for recovery, do you have a view on that? Well, it really depends what people mean by recovery. So, I mean, if you're thinking about the rate of change, like the improvement in the economy, uh, we're probably there. Like we're pro the, the economy in terms of it, the, the rate of contraction in the economy, uh, in fact, the contraction in the economy probably uh, we're probably bottoming out right now. So the economy will start growing again simply by the fact that we are, you know, people can go back to uh, cafes, people can go back to work, um, you know, things can open up. So in that sense, there is a recovery. Um, the question is, you know, when do we get back to, say, an unemployment rate of 5%? Uh, that's probably at least five years away now, three to five years. So the rate of recovery, growth will be recover, but it's still probably going to be quite weak. So we're probably still going to have below trend growth for a while, again, because uh, we're still going to have social distancing restrictions in place. And so um, it really depends what how people what, what people are sort of focusing on. So a U-shaped recovery to me means, yes, we bottom out, but we have below trend growth uh, for a while, such that it still take three years before we get back to the sort of level of activity we would otherwise have been at were there no crisis. A V-shaped recovery is we actually get back into above trend growth very quickly, 
uh, and we actually can get back to, say, the level of activity that we would have been at without the crisis within a year. So that's like a, the difference as I see it. Thanks, David. Uh, another quick one that's come through, just on the, the differences between the USD ETF and the YANK, and I'm, I'm happy to take that sure. one. USD is just basically a, a one-to-one USD exposure. YANK is a geared exposure to the US dollar, so you'll see a uh, heightened performance in both directions. So if the market goes down, you'll receive, a, I guess, a heightened down exposure, and conversely, on the upside, the same thing. Um, David, another another question that's come through: What happens if things haven't picked up when the time comes to remove job seeker, keeper, and mortgage deferrals, tenant support, these types of things? Any comment there? Well, look, I, I guess all, what happens is the government may may you know extend it. I guess you know the, the at the moment, I mean, people are spending money like without any consequence. Like like the US is spending you know hundred percent of of, of GDP on 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 um, on on, um, on 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 on, st on stimulus is just absolutely unbelievable. So, um, oh sorry, not of GDP of, ta of taxation. So I mean, the the deficit there is blown out to like you know ten percent of GDP. It's just quite extraordinary. So look, if push comes to shove and, and um, the economy is still weak and and the stimulus is going to end, well you know what the government will extend it, and so we'll just have an even bigger deficit. So that doesn't give me. A lot of uh, I'm not too concerned about the stimulus running out. If they need to, they'll just keep extending it. Uh, more, it's more that things are sort of in that halfway zone where things are okay enough that they start to, you know, remove it. Um, and again, there's some cases where people are, you know, and I'm not wanting to sort of say people are, you know, not on the on the on the payment that they don't deserve. But you know, there are some, you know, you're hearing reports of, um, you know. Some businesses gaming the system, you know, reporting uh, declines in revenue to give their workers money, and and you know, people, things like barristers and whatnot. On, on, I'm not, nothing against barristers, but like people on relatively high income and presumably uh, high assets, um, still on these payments. So that was where, when we're in this grey zone, where the economy is okay, not fantastic, and the government starts, you know, deciding they need to sort of peel it back. That's where I think the challenge will be. Good stuff, Dave. There's just a couple more here. A few quick ones from from me. Uh, there's one that's come through just with respect to our beta shares funds, all Australian domicile. Uh, indeed, they are. So no need for WA Ben forms or any type of paperwork when investing. Um, someone's mentioned uh, just gear in terms of a V-shaped recovery and, and whether or not that's appropriate. Uh, I think we have covered up in, in previous webinars that, that gear would, would sort of suit a, a V-shaped recovery type style. Uh, so gear is a, a geared Australian equities exposure for people that, that aren't aware um, and certainly would be appropriate for a V-shaped recovery. Um, David, a couple of questions just on commodities and in particular oil. Just in terms of your view, any any views with respect to oil price and, and where that sits at this point in time? Uh, look, oil, look, going into next, I mean, it's, you know, it's hard to have, a, I mean, it, you think about the, the what's happening with oil. I mean, oil's been, you know, absolutely belted because of the lockdowns. And so, you know, people not driving, demand for oil has plummeted globally. So that's the main driver of the weakness. So again, as, as restrictions are eased and assuming they aren't, you know, put in, put in place back to the same extent they were, you can be constructive on oil prices here, you know, recovering somewhat. They have already recovered. Um, but, you know, countering that is that the world then goes back to this oversupply sort of situation where if oil prices go up by enough, it means that, you know, US producers will still keep keep producing oil. Um, uh, so the world the world is awash with, with, with oil producers at the moment, which I still think will cap the upside for prices. So maybe, you know, they, 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 you know, they, they won't, you know, revisit their lows anymore. But I think, you know, a significant upside from here, I, I'm sort of not super bullish simply because, again, if need to, OPEC, which are already restraining their output, can incre increase output. They would love to increase output. So there's a lot of supply potential on the sidelines that will cap the gains. Having said all that, I mean, you know, fuel is a, is a again, if you believe in the recovery going into 2021, um, then something like the the, uh, the fuel ETF for the top energy producers globally uh, should do well, even if oil stabilises. I mean, even if oil stabilises at, 
you know, a reasonable a reasonable level, that'll be positive for those uh, major uh, major energy uh, uh, producers, which um, you know were negatively affected during the shutdowns. Good stuff, David. Look, the, the final question we've received, which is a really good one, is what, what's something that's available just to diversify your portfolio or have a diversified portfolio in one go? And certainly we do have a, a series of funds available now. Um, and I'd encourage you to look on the website under the Beta Shares Diversified Fund section. So they will give you a series of exposures from defensive up to high growth or conservative up to high growth. Uh, there's four series that will give you an all-in-one um, exposure to worldwide markets, so Australia, international and cash and fixed income within one trade, and they're available at 26 basis points. So for someone looking for a, an all-in-one diversified portfolio, I'd certainly encourage people to have a look at that. But uh, that's all our time for. Really appreciate the questions. There's some, some fantastic questions. If you do have any further questions, please contact us via our website or through our social channels. We will certainly get back to you. But really, once again, appreciate your time today and, and have a good day. Thanks for everyone.